I'm Ron Williams. I'm the newly elected president of the Herring Ponds Watershed Association. We are the sponsors of this talk. Uh, I'm newly elected, so if I make any serious gas, it's my fault. <laughs> Welcome to the meeting. Uh, I want to thank the Wildlands Trust for this beautiful facility. I want to thank the uh, Herring Ponds Watershed Association for the work that's been done. My wife, Jerry Williams, in the back has arranged this discussion for our benefit. She is our program chairman and our newsletter writer. And most of all, thanks to all of you for coming, for caring enough about health and water and, uh, and Nate that, uh, that you decided to, to take some time out of your valuable life to, to hear what he has to say. This is, a, this is a privilege for me to introduce Dr. Nate. Uh, Dr. Nate got his PhD in public health from the University of Arkansas, not from Harvard, and actually I think better of you for not going to Harvard, because I'm a brown man myself. <laughs> can't do football. But uh, he's a, since 2017, he's a public health director of the town of Plymouth. Uh, it's the first time we've had somebody at that professional level in that position. And I've been to a couple of his, his presentations. Um, he's a forward thinker. He's a long-term planner. He's a decision, a data-made decision. He uses data to make good decisions. And most important to me is that he cares about the environment and how the public health is affected by the environment going bad, if it does. He's worried about water, water quality. Uh, he's worried about our, uh, our future for the aquifer. And he's, he's taken an active interest as health director in our water supply. So tonight he's gonna to be talking about his initiatives in that, in that area. Trust you're all interested in water. We all are interested in water. We're all interested in public health. And Nate has done an incredible amount of thinking about public health, not just for old people, not just for young people, not just for males, females, different races. Everybody's public health is important. And he's got it planned. So um, after this, we're going to have a brief meeting of the Herring Ponds Watershed Association. So those of you who aren't members of our association, uh, are you welcome to stay? We're going to learn how to appeal milkweed ponds to encourage monarch growth. We have a, a presentation on that by our education director. Uh, we're going to have committee reports, but feel free to uh, take off and, and resume your lives. Um, so um, I want to introduce one distinguished guest that we have with us. Uh, we have John Mahoney here tonight, who is actually a member of our Harry Ponds Watershed Association. John is a selectman in the town of Plymouth, one of the more forward-thinking ones, in my opinion. And uh, he's also, as you probably know, running for state rep. So John, say hey. Hi. Hey. So without further ado, this is going to be an interesting presentation, and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing you again, Dr. Nick. Well, thank you very much. Do I need to use the microphone, or can everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. So, excuse me. I would still hold it. You would still hold it? So that can pick it up. Okay, great. So, excuse me. I'm kind of getting over a little bit of a, a, a cold, maybe, but I think it could have been neurovirus, but I'm okay, so no <laughs> need <laughs> to worry. There, so that makes for a memorable introduction. Um, so yes, but I know that Don introduced a very special guest, but I do want to introduce another special guest, our chair of the Board of Health, Brigitte Keen, who's been very instrumental in helping to get this ball rolling with me, and also Jerry Levine, who's also a member, who is very passionate and cares about the environment and public health, both of them do. So thank you too, I really appreciate you for being here and supporting me in this. Um, so 
as Don mentioned, um, I do have a strong care uh, for the public health and the environment. Um, part of my background uh, for my master's of public health is in environmental health science. And all too often, I didn't realize when I was working on my MPH at the time, we don't talk about the environment and the public's health enough. Uh, we talk about the environment in relation to the natural science and the trees and the water supply, uh, but a lot of municipalities don't make that connection. Um, and it's just not here in Massachusetts, I'm talking about nationwide. So this is still somewhat relatively new for municipalities to talk about this connection in public health. And for us in Plymouth, we actually have a huge mission with regards to the public's health and our Title V compliance, um, hence why we should talk about septic systems. And many of you, uh, you know, it, it is. It's like a big elephant in the room. We talk about it, uh, and how do we try to address it? Uh, because we do know that cesspools and impaired septic systems contribute to the degradation and the impairment of our waterways and other uh, parts of our environment. And the other piece of that that we haven't articulated very well is what is the disease impact? And that disease impact meaning long-term chronic health. And chronic health doesn't manifest itself in apparent ways and measures. So for instance, if you're consuming something, some water that may be contaminated with a foreign substance such as illicit drugs that may impact your nervous system or your ability to function or your metabolism. And so it could manifest itself in, in ways and means of obesity, um, perhaps even Alzheimer's, um, uh, early onset type 2 diabetes. Uh, those are just a few that the literature has been able to point out. So I take this very seriously, um, and uh, so does the board. I, I always have to say that because uh, we don't have adequate enough regulations, in my opinion, to really address this issue and to try to work with our engineers in such a way that we can get ahead of this. Um, but I will say that is changing. So I am happy to uh, be here, and you guys are going to get like a preview of what is expected to come here. So the the environmental rationale, I kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier in terms of how do we make this connection. Um, and I'm very happy to be working with David Gould, too, who's Director of Marine Environmental Affairs. Um, and he's gotten a little bit of a, my own a, a dose of public health in the environment, meaning that, hey, we know that things are highly eutrophic, and we know that development has spurred that high eutrophication um, since the 1970s in certain areas. And then after talking with Don about some of these things, there's a huge concern about how are we planning for the future and considering how are we degrading our waterways and our environment? Are we using evidence-based policy? Are we using the data in the best way and form and fashion that we can at the municipal level? Uh, munis munis municipalities struggle with this, but fortunately we have people who have expertise to try to get ahead of this problem. So I may sound like a broken record by saying getting ahead of this problem, but it's baked into me to be proactive, so excuse me for that. So we do know that cyanobacteria and algae growth is a huge issue. Uh, I remember probably the first week when I got here, I got phone calls from people. I had no clue who was who, and Nate, there's green stuff growing on my pond. Dr. Nate, um, I see stuff running off onto the side here. Dr. Nate, someone's dumping fecal matter or something else into the pond and it's contributing to this growth. And so the more and more I got to study things, and also with the unfortunate issue at the Bartlett Pond Brook, um, I've had to find out that algal growth or cyanobacteria is a huge environmental and public health issue. Uh, so much so, in fact, that um, Congress has a subcommittee that's dedicated to this, HABs, harmful algal blooms, and they actually have money set aside for municipalities to take advantage of. So we are looking to get into that avenue, hopefully here pretty soon, to probably try to go for those federal monies and work with different watershed associations. So that is on my radar. And as I've said earlier about the public health rationale and the connection, uh, for me, it's about what are people getting exposed to? Um, and then do people even know they're getting exposed to these different types of harmful contaminants, whether it be through private wells, um, are we having a, a adequate enough water treatment to address some of the future things that may be coming about? And I say future things, uh, really they're not future, but for example, we have an opioid epidemic issue, we have people uh, putting their antibiotics into the waterways, and that may lead to antibiotic resistant growth of E. coli, um, and also people are putting their needles into uh, the sewers and also into their septics. So when you have that happen, your septic could be impaired and it could break down. 
Um, and so, oh, well, it, it'll be fine. It goes into the ground. Well, yeah, it goes into the ground, but where does that ultimately end up? Um, and as Don and I talked about, uh, we, we have a huge concern about our aquifer health. So we're trying to look long term here and put all these pieces of the puzzle together. And it's quite complicated. Um, so you just can't say one thing without considering the full extent of everything else. So that interaction, like I talked about, in our department, public health, we have that principal concern for Title V. So when we say Title V, it's just not about going out there and making sure people have a, a septic system installed and, and that's all good. We have to consider things such as setback distances from, excuse me, setback distances from a well, setback distances from a water body, and we also have to talk about how is that impacting someone else next door because if your septic system fails, you have two years apparently to fix it, or if you have a cesspool, you have two years to fix it, but it's unsightly. You don't know what type of pathogens could be produced in a soil. You don't know if any kids are running around. Uh, so it, it can be quite complex, and with me looking at this, I have to say to myself, okay, how is that impacting our bathing beaches too? Because some septic systems are along a pond and some of these ponds have beaches and people will frolic and play on them. So what happens is that we test these, these areas and we only test for colony forming units, not specific bacteria. That's a problem because you don't know which types of harmful bacteria are in the water body. So that's just a standard testing because our budget, we can't afford some of the nice fancy testing. Um, but in certain situations we can. And so we just normally say close down the beach, no one go, go down to the beaches, and we only do testing within a certain parameter. So I am trying to work on us doing a better or modified sampling strategy um, that takes into account what are things looking like pre-season, what are things looking like with the amount of cesspools and septic systems as well in that area, and how may they be influencing them, and can we leverage education among people so that way they can understand how to better care for their septic systems. So that's how we're looking at things in terms of the interaction with those septic systems along places uh, with, in our beaches. And then the other thing is, is that I've been spending a lot of time uh, out and about with our engineers. And the engineers seem to have this concept of how do we need to put in good septic systems and how does that match up with our soils? That's the first concern is the soils are soils. If it's sandy, it's all good. And I have to say, look guys, wait a minute. Where does that ultimately go when it goes into the ground? And believe it or not, a lot of them don't understand, some do. And they say, well, it just goes straight down. I said, well, it goes into a plume and it could move down into the drainage way into a pond. So yes, it does sound good to be 400 feet, 500 feet away from a water, water body or waterway, that's great. But still, that could accumulate and move into a pond area, and that could foster the growth because septic systems contribute to about 70% of nitrate growth. Uh, excuse me, uh, they, they produce about 70% of nitrates in our waterways. So I'm not an aquifer expert, I will say that. Um, so my knowledge in Title V has been growing a lot, and people have reached out to us to ask, well, is it safe to drink the water? And uh, should I be pumping from my well? And I, I have to tell them, I said, the best available evidence suggests that, yes, it is okay based off of your most recent well testing. Um, but as development keeps growing, we really have to look at this picture and try to understand how are we taking care of our aquifer for the future uh, with these septic systems? Um, and do we need to consider any other alternative means and measures uh, because do we, do we know if we're consuming certain things from the septic systems if they're failing or cesspools if they're failing? Um, and uh, although they, you know, we really don't talk about them much, but Sakewish is an area that um, we're really looking at to try to uh, get a better handle on what's going on. Um, and then I know there's a big uh, worry or concern about this area down south and what's happening. And I've talked with Don plenty of times to develop future sampling strategies that consider how are we uh, going to think about consuming water from certain wells and then also working with the DPW if they're going to look at different well sites as well too. Uh, because no one has taken into consideration the public health data before uh, when we're talking about our aquifer and well sites. So some of the initiatives I mentioned kind of in passing, and one of the big things that we're doing is our fats, oils, and grease initiative. 
And also it's going to talk about flushing wet wipes and needles and other foreign substances down into your septic systems. So this effort is going to be initiating here in November. So you will see uh, some nice PSAs with me and someone from the sewer division talking about these things because we've had calls of people saying, hey, is it okay to put a diaper in my septic system? And yes, I know. And, and I'm like, no, it's not okay. And then I've had people say, well, it says flushable wet wipes. Can I flush them down there? And no, you can't, even though it says it on there. And then these are the people who had failed septic systems. And we'll have Title V inspectors go out and look, and they'll say, hey, Nate, um, I hate to tell you, but it basically was like, a garbage pit in the, in the septic system. And it led to the leaching or over leaching or mini cesspool in someone else's yard. So there's a lot of people, based off of these phone calls I'm getting, they don't understand how to care for their septic system. And the fats, oils, and greases, what they do is they essentially create a sludge pit within that septic system, and that is actually a breeding ground for disease. So pathogens such as your hepatitis C, um, even hepatitis A, and then also, like I said earlier, the antibiotic-resistant E. coli. So these are things that could be running off if people aren't taking care of the system. And then the other thing that we're doing is that this, this is one of the things, working with other organizations to try to leverage ways and how to monitor their watershed in regards to any public health impact. So a White Horse Beach Working Group, um, that's like an ad hoc example. Uh, but this approach, working with Don, is trying to be more proactive and not waiting for anything emergent so that way we can try to understand and monitor things with regards to who's in what community and try to advise on how to develop with regards to septic systems as well. And then the next thing that we're looking at doing, and, and this is one of my bread and butters, is developing a digitized database system. So that way we can look at all of the properties that have Title V systems and be able to get ahead and say, this system may be failing because it's X amount of years old, or this system was pumped on this last date and you need to get an updated pumping of your system. Because currently right now, we don't have a system in place to advise and enforce Title V compliance of any one system. We've grown so much that we have no idea who's done what, but fortunately, because of a student, thank goodness for interns, They've been able to come in and catalog all of our Title V systems that we've had in Plymouth. We're almost done. So then the next thing that we're doing is through our Board of Health is that we're developing evidence-based policy. So discussions are soon to come about so that way we can talk about how do we regulate appropriately and responsibly with our Title V systems. So that way we can encourage healthy and safe and responsible development. And then those two initiatives, I would say, are going to be the big things that are going to be happening uh, in regards to the people's public health. The first one that, that's up there that's talking about cataloging um, that I mentioned earlier, we're 80% finished in phase one. Phase two is essentially going to involve us using that information with GIS and also use that information to help develop sectors to talk about what are the areas that are potentially most at risk and to help advise in our policy and also to use it in talks with our organizations that have watersheds so that way no one is flying blind anymore in terms of compliance because I've gotten questions all too often about compliance, compliance, and I can't answer them, but soon we'll be, we'll be able to answer that big question. So we only have one more drawer to scan and we're going to be finished. So by the end of this month, we're going to really have a somewhat of a good idea on what's happening. But then phase two, like I said, is extracting that data and then developing these most at-risk or least at-risk sectors based on what we're seeing in regards to who's compliant and who's not. And we want to also be able to educate, um, send out notices and of awareness and to let people know ahead of time before they're trying to sell their home um, or before they're trying to buy a home so that way people don't have to get caught up with the surprise. And then in terms of the regulatory aspect, discussions are gonna be underway very soon, so that way people can start to see what is it gonna be like to have a Title V healthy community, uh, because currently as it stands, um, we don't have those regulations, but I'm excited for those. So I think we can talk about some of the lessons learned um, from the White Horse Beach issue because we didn't have a good idea about our Title V compliance, uh, because that's a 30-year-old problem. Um, some of you may have seen some of this information,
but this is how these systems basically interact or play on things with our bacteria or pathogens in public health. I don't know if you all can see that, but I'll go ahead and I'll read some of this off. Um, when the concerns started coming in uh, for Bartlett Pond, people were worried about what is in it, what is in it. And yes, we found algae, but everyone else or a lot of people were asking me about what other pathogens are in that besides just silent bacteria. And so we did testing. And the first thing we found, which was something considered very normal, was enterococci. Uh, you find it all up and down the northeast or the east coast, and it comes and it goes. Not that big of a concern for most people. The level was double that above the, above the level of concern. And then so the following week, we found E. coli and fecal coliform. So the fecal coliform is a clear indication of waste coming right out of someone's septic system or cesspool. And the E. coli, um, it's not a common thing to see in waterways unless you have runoff as well too. And then the level of E. coli was uh, eight times higher above the level of concern. So that made me nervous, it made me pretty scared. Um, definitely didn't want anyone in that area to get into the water. And then so the next week, I was like, great, it's all good. But when you do your sampling, you want to get two times in a row or three times in a row to rule out any false positives or any false negatives. And so then the next week, trifecta. All three come back above the level of concern. And I couldn't believe it. Um, the other people that live in the area couldn't believe it because they had no idea how their septic systems or cesspools were impacting the pond in the Brook area. And then so we did more testing, and enterococci came back. And then another round of testing, E. coli and enterococci kept coming back again. And then so finally, we wrapped up the summer months of the testing um, because we had to be careful with funding. And also, um, people started to leave in the area. So we made sure there wasn't a high accumulation of, of residents or visitors coming back. And that's why we ended up, the t we ended the testing. So in summary, we found that 66% of the time there was enterococci, E. coli, 50% of the time, and then about 33% of the time, fecal coliform. So E. coli for me was huge on the radar because, I mean, you can die from E. coli and it doesn't manifest itself immediately. The incubation period can be uh, 10 to 20 days. So we can have a visitor to come and enjoy our waterways and go home and die from something else. Um, and so I'm, I'm not meaning to laugh about it, um, but it, it's, it's just something that we don't think about. And we have to think about that when protecting our waterways. Um, so that definitely was something that came to my attention and other members um, on the selectmen's attention too because this is the first time that we ever cataloged this in the town of Plymouth despite having a report from 1984 about this watershed. So um, guys, I did plan on speaking and leaving because I thought I had to go to another engagement. Um, so excuse me for wrapping this up a little bit faster, but I definitely want to have a discussion format because I think one of the things we need to talk about is how do we move long term on this? Um, this is something that's not just going to go away. We can't fix it overnight. Uh, we do have to consider how do we mitigate this and how do we work with the community? Um, and also, yes, in the town interdepartmentally because public health uh, for me, in the way in which I was trained, is to be community-based, rely on the science, and also to rely on the data, and to talk about being proactive with the long-term strategy. And I think that's what we're doing with the department and with the board. So um, with that being said, I want to open this up for uh, questions or discussion. That's all I got. Yes. Absolutely. Um, expanding the um, sewerage. sewerage. Thank you. And in, in what regard? Because um, well, you know, in, in, uh, in what regard? Mm -hmm. Everybody is on a septic system. Has the you know, and, and uh, we put in this 
this big system to collect and clean and distribute back into the ocean and uh, it was big enough to attach the town of Kingston to it, but what about the people of Plymouth? Why aren't, why aren't they expanding it for the people of Plymouth? So the town has considered it. However, the way I, the reason why I asked you about regard is because there's been talks of putting, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Yeah, uh, people with big voices, excuse me. So yes, the town has considered it, but the reason why I ask them what regard is because of the phases, number one, and then also number two, there's been talk of allocating or placing different wastewater treatment facilities in different places around the town and, and having them um, rely on that type of mechanism. So instead of doing a contiguous sewer connection. So there's been various talks in ways of that matter, yes. So people are talking about it. Yes, people are talking about it. Well, that's a good thing. I would like to think so because it's a gold standard according to the CDC. I'd like to add a little bit to that. I mean, it's easy to say it would be great to uh, put sewer all throughout the town. It's terribly expensive for number one, but for number two, there's an unintended consequence of doing that everywhere. And that unintended consequence is that you get development prior to when it ordinarily would occur if you sewer a, uh, a low density population area. And I'm not sure you want to do that. So what, what's really needed here is a measured plan. And the town has done, I think most of you will remember seeing out Route 44, uh, uh, exit six heading west. They did that fairly recently. That was part of the plan because it was dense enough to, to take that. And the next plan, as I understand it, is to do something in Manomet, but the, um, the engineering is difficult because everything is kind of uphill from Manomet, and they, the, uh, the, the Entergy uh, sewer treatment plant is not big enough to handle all of Manomet, so it's tricky, but that is next on the radar as far as I know. Also, as far as I know, and John Mahoney may want to add something to this because he's here. We could put him on the spot. Uh, but to my knowledge, there's, there's, it hasn't gone any further than that. And that's to me, is the real issue. How far can we go uh, and how far out can we project without doing ourselves a disservice by getting development faster than we really want it and faster than it's even happening now? Carl? Uh, Carl, great question. So in 2002, the community opened up a $45 million wastewater treatment facility in Camelot. It was designed to take 3 million gallons of flow a day for roughly 15 years. It was only taking 1.5 to 1.6, only anywhere from 45 to 55% capacity. Um, any other community would have salivated over a condition like that. Um, you know, unfortunately here, that was a problem. Why there was no expansion for 15 years, I can't tell you. AECOM came in, I believe in 2012 or 2013, made a presentation to the board. They gave us a 40-year plan from 2013 to 2052 and how to maximize out the facility and get up to 3 million gallons of flow a day. Phase one was taking the pipe out 44, where uh, up until a year or two ago, it stopped in front of the old Hess which is now a speedway. We sent it west, I don't know, half a mile, three quarters of a mile. So when you talk about the 201 lots out there, you're not dealing with a lot of politics because only one of them is residential. And that was Algonquin Heights. And Algonquin, as you, you might know, is a privately owned, federally subsidized affordable housing unit that has had a failed septic system for 20 to 30 years. So they didn't have a choice but to get in. The other 200 lots were industrial commercial. So we had to pass a betterment, which we did. We passed a 3.9 or a $4.1 million betterment, which means that nobody in this room paid for the construction of opening up the road and putting the pipe there so that those businesses could access uh, you know, town sewer. You had a couple of minor complaints, but for the most part, it went through easily. Now, from what I'm told, the project's complete. 
I think we're picking up an incremental 250 to 280,000 gallons of flow a day. So now you're in that 55 to 60 percent, still have a lot of unused capacity. Phase two was going to go from JB's corner down to the plantation. The plantation from what I'm told, gets about, during their peak in the summertime, they do 30 to 40,000 gallons of flow a day, but they have a septic system. They want to get onto town septic. But this is where the political minefield lays. You're not going to open up uh, Warren Avenue and put a pipe in the ground unless everybody is in. And now the only thing you have between JB's Corner in the plantation is residential. So if you want to see a future selectman's meeting that gets very contentious, it will be forcing a betterment on Warren Avenue, okay? And some of those people, maybe half of them will be okay with it, but the other half will not, okay? And you need a vote of the Board of Selectmen. Now, in my opinion, um, I, I, I couldn't validate putting a pipe in the ground and bringing it down to the plantation unless everybody was in. But with respect to what Don was saying, there are other factors that come into play, and if you do something like that, maybe you're promoting um, you know, large amounts of development in areas where you don't want it. But with respect to what Don was saying earlier about sewering Manomet, I have heard nothing to that effect. So I don't, I don't know where he got that, but... Okay, I'll check in with him. But these, these things take years, and I don't know why it took so long to get 44 done. That seems to me have, to have been a slam dunk. That should have been done a decade ago. We just got that done, but that's where it stands as far as, that's all the updated information I have. What's the hospital on? They're in, they're in the system. They're in the yeah, system. yeah, you get so down. It goes up that yeah, side. yep. It goes down to basically Bradford's there, the packet store, and it comes up and gets the hospital. So it's only a half mile to my <laughs> are you on? Are you on Warren? No, up on Rivers. Oh, okay. So, oh no, I've I've heard from people down in that neighborhood before that if you bring it to the plantation and then don't bring it another quarter mile to my house, I'm not going to be happy. Yeah. But that you you so that phase two, you're probably looking at two to four years away, where your DPW director comes to the board of selectmen and says, "This is next." Well, we're talking about leaching into into water systems, and we're on. I, I know, so now, now, if you go down to Manomet, now you're talking about an, uh, maybe a smaller facility down in Manomet. You're talking about tens of millions of dollars. You're talking about raising taxes, you're talking about borrowing money, and this is where it gets. And trust me, I've, I'm not an expert on this, but I've said, for, I've said as long as I've been involved, the policy with respect to Whitehorse Beach is stand by and watch as millions of gallons of untreated human waste is injected into uh, the pond, the stream, the beach, and uh, the Atlantic Ocean. And, and these are the repercussions, what he's presenting tonight, so. Thank you. I uh, have a couple of questions. Uh, one is, does your digitized database include uh, the, uh, the cesspools? Yes. Okay, that's a good start. Because <laughs> I was afraid that it was gonna say you're doing Title Fives and you don't know where the cesspools are. No, so when I want to make sure I clear up this misnomer, when I say Title V, it encompasses cesspools. Okay. So, yes. Uh, the other thing is can we have some discussion of cyanobacteria? Certainly. I'd like, to, I'm, I'm just going to say let's, let's open it up for discussion because a number of us around here are experiencing problems with, with what looks like cyanobacteria, certainly a lot of algae and a lot of pondweed and so forth. So, um, okay, I, I, yeah, I don't know where we need to start with that, except for one, acknowledging that I am aware that it is happening, as is David Gould. And yes, uh, I know you all understand that it is hard for us to be omnipresent and omnipotent to address this issue. But honestly, when I tell you, we are doing the best that we can with what we have. Um, we're not ignoring or, or doing anything on standby. And I'm trying to interface with him and, and Kim to develop some type of management plans and we'll also work with different associations so that way we can try to tackle this um, the best way we can. But also, from what I understand with some of the science that is out there, even though a lot of the science on this is still in its infancy, a lot of this water that may be in the ponds could be 
five to ten years old because of the way that our waterways ebb and flow and rise with the groundwater. So isotope, radioisotope testing is something that we have to do. So that's something the chair and I have actually discussed. So the factors, like I said, are very complex. We're talking about what is in our waterways and what is in our watershed. Um, so like I, and also I mentioned the HABs, harmful algal blooms, the Congress, a subcommittee on HABs in the Congress has recognized that a lot of municipalities, um, not just the small ones, these are big ones. I mean, not just Florida, Madison, Wisconsin has a huge issue with this right now. Um, and they don't have the resources or the funds to try to get a hold on this. I mean, this is a, a multi-billion dollar problem. And unfortunately, we have almost, what, 400 ponds close to about that. And then we have a lot of people trying to enjoy them. Um, so... And I saw a, a, frown, uh, I'm a frown over there, but people are trying to enjoy them from what I heard, I think. Um, oh, oh, I thought I thought it was not. But, but yes, people are trying to enjoy them. Concern. Okay, good. Okay. So people are trying to enjoy them, and how do we choose, pick and choose which ones? How do we prioritize it? Um, it? It's a hard, complex problem, but we're trying to strategize, yes. I mean, it, does anyone else have anything to add or questions about that? Because I just don't want to skirt this issue. We've heard and seen uh, bodies of water where the signs are up that it's contaminated and you shouldn't go swimming and dogs shouldn't drink the water, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what is known about the impacts of the actual aquatic life? Are they affected by that at all? You, you see people fishing in these ponds. Is it safe to eat what they catch? Uh, what about cranberry bogs that get uh, water from those ponds to irrigate and, and then uh, pick the cranberries? So without adequate and pinpoint testing to, to give you a precise answer, uh, my answer as a public health official would be to exercise caution. If you have seen any type of algal growth or potential algal growth or any type of pond scum, I would be careful because it could lead to that fish or that aquatic life um, bioaccumulating these toxins. Um, and if you eat them, uh, it's not really known very well as to what could happen to a human over time. Um, again, these are small toxic shocks, um, for lack of better words, to your system. So, uh, like I said, it's really unknown as to what could happen, but the science is pointing to that um, it could lead to um, poison, meaning death, if you consume um, you know, small amounts over time or any type of chronic impaired so health. So, th these toxins do bioaccumulate just like... Metals and other Absolutely. toxins. Absolutely. Yes. Can you tell us anything about the treatment center downtown, sewage treatment center? How far about mean high tide and storm surge is that? I mean, we've seen Plymouth Rock underwater. Is, is that thing going to wind up underwater? I can't predict the future, uh, per se, but, uh, and I'm not trying to poke fun at you but uh, by saying that, but I mean it because um, with climate change, uh, um, it's, it's the likelihood exists, yes, um, and we don't know what that's going to do in terms of to, to the wastewater treatment facility down, you know, downtown. I, I, I can't give you a definitive answer. Well, I think we have to talk about doing or developing something within our Whitehorse Beach Management Plan or any other plan in areas along the coast because CZM, Coastal Zone Management, has had that discussion, a preliminary discussion at that, to talk about doing some planning because of those issues that you just brought up. So right now, we're still in the planning phase to try to get at least an idea on what could we expect to do with, long, with that long-range planning. And that's why, I mean, I, I have the switch on there. We, we got to start thinking long-term. Sewer systems or the water system or 
Right, and and also I will say that I have actually gotten really encouraging response from our planning director to talk about these things. So we will be talking about housing and things with the interaction in public health. So that is going to occur later this month. I also wanted to thank you for uh, the question that you asked, and just to add something to that, if you don't mind. Um, I am the chair of the Board of Health, but I'm also an alternate on the planning board and a regular participant on the Conservation Commission. So um, we are strategically aligning all of our initiatives through the chairs and through our directors in order to be able to answer the questions that you have today better, particularly better over time. But I want to invite everyone to the Board of Health meeting tomorrow at 7 p.m. Um, our first presentation at 7 p.m. is going to be from uh, John Judge and his uh, hydrogeologist. The topic that we asked him to speak on was a private wastewater treatment system for um, a large community. So um, as you know, Pine Hills has a private wastewater treatment facility, and we want to ask him, he's giving a presentation, how does it work, how do they test it, how do they draw down water, what are they doing in Pine Hills to protect our water sources. That presentation is tomorrow at 7 p.m. Uh, at Town Hall um, during the uh, Board of Health meeting in the Cordage, or in the, yeah, no, I keep, rope walk. Rope walk. I keep calling it Cordage, they are ropes, right? Um, and then secondarily, at our next Board of Health meeting, this is part of our educational series. Uh, that's on October 24th. Um, the um, Buzzards Bay Watershed Co Coalition is going to be speaking on uh, coastal waterways. How do you uh, put in um, septic systems that don't, or, um, or that don't negatively impact coastal water systems, what they're doing around the Buzzards Bay, which stretches all the way from Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, down to New Bedford and beyond. They have a lot of experience with that. They're working with Massachusetts on a lot of demonstration systems. And we want to learn more about that. And we've invited every one of our engineers that we've worked with to come to these presentations because, and they are incentivized because they know that our regulations will be changing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, and, and to, to add back to uh, the aquatic life issue, again, is that um, if you've been paying attention, I mean, we got so much going on in this world. Uh, Vibrio is uh, another pathogen of concern that occurs. And I did ask a question to some officials. Um, and I had said, well, with the emergence of climate change and also with contaminants coming from our septic systems, could we expect to see a rise in things such as Vibrio? And the answer again was is that the science really isn't there to talk about it. And it was an honest answer because I went and I researched it and you didn't really see anything. So then, you know, a couple months later, here is it's warm and on NPR you hear about Vibrio, Vibrio, Vibrio and climate change and contaminants from things such as septic systems along the South Shore. So... Yes, those things are of concern uh, with our food system. We, we love to eat, you gotta eat good in order to be healthy. Um, but if our aquaculture is at risk um, because of septic systems or cesspools, you know, we, we have to start thinking about these things long term. So uh, this is some, something new in the town of Plymouth, I think, with what we're doing with our department and with our board. So we have a long way to go, but we're getting out in front of it. So I hope that's encouraging. Hi. Um, for cyanobacteria, how many ponds in Plymouth have confirmed outbreaks this year? And then a second question, what is the best process for reporting suspected outbreaks? Those are very good questions um, because uh, I've heard people say to me um, various times, I I'm not going to lie at all about it. I can't keep up. I know it's in the double digits. Um, I'm not going to exaggerate. I know it's not 20, but... Um, it easily at minimum, I've had 10 reports from 10 different ponds. Um, and in terms of uh, people looking and reporting, uh, it's hard because with the Whitehorse Beach situation, it looked like nothing was there when they tested. Um, so like, like I call it, non-visible cyanobacteria um, occurred. And this type of species of bacteria, the cyanobacteria, um, wasn't well studied enough. Um, and that was a report from the DEP. Uh, but people calling in to the public health department um, is definitely a good way to, to report and also doing it electronically 
on our website, um, you can report it that way. Or you can call the Department of Public Health at the state level if we're not answering. And then they can actually attempt to send someone out and have them to test. Because right now, we don't have that capability to test for cyanobacteria uh, with certainty. However, DMEA, they have the ability to do a surrogate measure to determine if there may be a presence of cyanobacteria, but it's not 100% certain. It's a proxy measure. Um, so those are the ways, the ways and means in which you can report cyanobacteria, possible sites of cyanobacteria. Just, just wanted to ask, when you have your septic system pumped by a licensed pumper, is that data that goes into your digitized database? So good question, again, because we do get some pumping reports from some people, not everybody. And as it stands right now, the amount of personnel that it takes to review and to catalog that information, uh, it, it requires a lot because we have records from that are retro and we have some records that are present. Um, so right now I do have one vendor uh, who is submitting stuff and we're going to match that data with that information. So that way we can actually update it, yes. Do you have the authority to require that the pumpers report? That's something you have to talk about uh, with the Board of Health to make mandatory reporting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then my, my last question would be, uh, is your digitized database accessible to the public? So thank you. That's the other thing I forgot to mention, so I appreciate the question. So like I said, I'm a very community-based oriented person. Um, I want to be able to make this data in a responsible way available to the public so that way you can use it for your own understanding. Um, because I, I will say it, I've been in communities long enough to know people get data, they get angry, and they want to you know, go at the man. But the purpose of the data is for you to understand how can you be a better steward or how can you educate someone else so that way they don't make these same mistakes. So that is the plan. So that way we can become a more actionable oriented community. I mean, because we just can't keep throwing money at problems. We all got to do something about it together. So that's the reason for me wanting to make it accessible to the public. Yes. Hi. You mentioned um, about coordinating with other um, groups like Herring, uh, Herring uh, Pond Association. Um, I want to learn more about how, uh, how we'd be able to do that. I, I'm from the Friends of Ellisville Marsh, uh, and we have a lot of records uh, for testing data going back for uh, well over a dozen years for Ellisville Marsh and more from that Savory Pond where we had repeated cyanobacteria <coughs> outbreaks for a number of years and had none this year. So we're not on your, not on your um, horizon for this year. Um, so we've been working very hard to, to track it and figure out what's going on with it. But I, uh, our group would certainly want to be involved in the educational part of this, and also we'd like to make sure that our data isn't just lying on a shelf someplace because we do have quite a bit. Yes, so uh, I, I won't say contact me and stand in line um, be, because the way the way that I'm working, and I, and I forgot to mention, I'm also working with the six ponds uh, with an individual right now too, and he's been waiting on us to get this data catalog uh, so that way he can do his thing. And um, the way to really, I mean, just schedule a meeting and then we can go from there. Because again, like I said earlier, we're trying to develop these sectors so that we can talk about most at risk and least at risk. Um, and then the nerdy side of me wants to develop some prediction algorithms so that way we can see what does the old data tell us and how do we inform on the future? What are the likelihoods if this were to happen and run some simulations possibly? So that, that's the nerdy side of me so we can truly get ahead of this problem and talk about the percentages and the correlations or the odds associated with what's going on in these different areas. So. That's the, that's the plan. Like I'm really trying to bring what I can to the table here for Plymouthians and our visitors too um, with doing that. So I'm, I'm trying my best, but schedule a meeting, yes. I'm gonna give you a simplistic idea of what needs to happen. I mean, honestly, we need to sewer the whole town eventually but failing that, and I've, I've already given reasons why we shouldn't do it right away, but failing that, have you come up with any plan for 
tightening up the requirements on the septic systems that are put in, not only for their ability to separate out certain things, because we're, we're getting an influx of pharma and personal care products that are doing harm, and they're very expensive and hard to analyze, but also the location. I mean, tightening up how far they, they need to be from water bodies, uh, and how far they need to be from wells and all things like that. I know there are regulations that stipulate that now, but would it do any good to A, tighten up on uh, the, uh, the, um, the complexity of the septic systems and, and the cost uh, and the uh, bylaws that govern their location? A uh, very, very good question uh, because it, it, this is twofold. This is showing how the department works with the board in evidence-based policy. So some people have told me that's a buzzword, but it's really not. So being out in the field and working with the engineers, some of them have, I'm serious, some of them have a hard time understanding how they may be impacting the environment and people's health when they design and put things in certain places. So with that being said, getting data from different associations and being able to communicate that to the engineer as well and saying that, well, this is how you're actually doing X, Y, and Z when you're doing you know, implementation of this septic system. And then once they know that, they're like, well, what else can I do? And then you say, well, if we have the regulations in place, we can actually use it as real good guidance to say that this is what else you can do. So yes, Don, the short answer is tightening up those regulations with the Board of Health Chair and the members is going to be a huge benefit. Um, even though people are going to say, oh my gosh, what's happening here? I, I got to pay for this. Well, I mean, you're going to pay for it somewhere else, whether it's through health care, uh, whether it's through um, somebody else having to utilize more services in your municipality. So why not try to eliminate something long term by saying, well, let's be good stewards to the environment so that way everyone can benefit from it and not have to worry about their water uh, or, or developing a waterborne disease. So, so yes, the regulations, they have to be tightened up. I mean, we're growing so fast here in Plymouth, we're not even taking a, a breath to even consider, consider this. And before it's too late, um, I'm not going to name this town, but someone said we're going to end up like a town north of us uh, because their water bodies are impaired and they don't have a mechanism to efficiently deal with it because it ter it's turned into a, a, almost a billion dollar problem for them. Um, and we shouldn't get down that road, and regulations are a cheap and effective way to do it. I didn't let the air out the room on that one, did I? <laughs> Yeah, so that, I think that's a very advanced problem, um, and that has come up so many times, uh, and not just uh, people doing agricultural stuff from big, big commercial places, but organophosphates from fertilizer in lawns. Um, so that's something that we can't even get to right now, but we know it's an issue. Um, but I think for us, we're just going to have to really educate, educate, educate. Uh, we can't do anything enforcement-wise. Um, what was it? About three weeks ago, it was National Septic System Week from the, the Environmental Protection Agency. And that came and that went. And I, I thought someone was going to be like, oh, this is great, Dr. Nate. I, I mean... <laughs> We don't need a week. We need almost like half a year to educate just because this is a, this is a small blip on lots of people's radar, but it's a huge, huge problem. When you talk about the regulations, are we talking statewide regulations or local regulations? Is there anything statewide that's moving? In the right direction. So statewide, there's nothing that's moving in our direction. Um, this is unofficial information that I'm about to share with you. 
Um, but as far as it goes for Title V compliance and septic system from the state, uh, they're leaving it as is. Uh, they're not going to advance anything extra or mandatory. Um, that's, that's through the grapevine. I got that from a credible source. So it's up to the locals to really look at how do we try to fix our waterways through Title V compliance if that is in fact impacting our waterways. So we have to be more innovative and we have to be more responsible. Um, so we just can't leave it to the state. Um, this is for, for them. This issue is is neutral right now. Okay. Um, with the development here and so much growth, uh, do you think that it would be of use to develop a brochure or a packet that you could give to the realtors? Because so many people are moving out here from the city, have no idea that they ha even have a septic system and what they shouldn't put down it. They all want a garbage disposal because they had a garbage disposal in the city. Right. Um, they think they can put anything down their sink. So would it be worth developing something, uh, an educational tool that we could be given out? like that. Uh, absolutely, it's definitely worth it. Um, but as you heard our chair mention for the board is that having a series, um, these conversations, they, they have to happen. I mean, I'm actually super encouraged to see this amount of people interested in a box in a ground that lets waste come out. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to, to hear about this, you know. Um, and also on a side note, I teach in Boston um, at MCPHS and there's a student from India that wants to talk about uh, fecal contamination in, in, in their uh, country. So I have to go back to the students and, and utilize them to do this. But the point that I'm, I'm bringing up is, is that you have people who have master's degrees that are like, how do we fix our fecal issue? Um, and you would have think we would have figured it out by now and we haven't. So yes, a brochure, a pamphlet, a book, um, commercials, uh, working with PAC TV more to really get the word out because this isn't going away anytime soon and we just don't need one week. You know, we, we need more time, we really do. But, but yes, uh, to your point, people from the city, they don't know. I'd like to just say one more thing. Um, again, the Board of Health is, is responsible for the regulations. The Department of Public Health is not the responsible party for regulations. We work together so to, um, to pass the regulations and then to implement them and enforce them. So we're kind of the enforcing body and then the regulatory body. But that being said, um, our meetings are on the town website and our agenda is always posted before, by law, the meeting. And you will see on each and every meeting that there are variances that are being requested for septic installations by our engineers. I can tell you that the vast majority of those variances that are being presented to us are being presented along wetlands, ponds, coastal waterways. We are hearing four variances this Wednesday after Mr. Judge from Pine Hills and his hydrogeologist speak for Herring Pond for houses that are going to be upgraded, so they need to be, uh, have a new septic system because they have cesspools. So if you want to come as the public, it's an open meeting. You can say to these engineers how you feel about this. I think it's what a public meeting is for. So I'm just saying, you don't need to be silent. It's going on each and every other Wednesday, two Wednesdays per month and most of our variances, again, are along waterways. And you'll hear how the board um, thinks about these things, and we would love your support. We would absolutely love your support. Come and join us. <laughs> well, <laughs> we, we, ended, we ended up in the old Colony Memorial each and every issue in the last several months. Yeah, that's, that's one of the ones. <laughs> I can tell you we, on Blueberry Lane, we got a favorable um, opinion from our legal counsel, the fact that we actually have um, limited them to seasonal use in the property. So um, it's not, I can tell you from that one, and it's a matter of public record, you can look it up. Um, what we offered them, because they are on a pond, is to say, you can put in a phosphorus 
limiting septic system? The layer cake is a nitrogen limiting, and that is more for a coastal waterway, but it, that was just to introduce our engineers to newer systems. Um, so we gave them that opportunity. And as a percentage of upgrading the house, it's really a small dollar amount as a percentage of upgrading the house. But they came back to us and said they chose not to do that. So if you choose not to do that, and we did say you can move ahead with your septic, then we only had another choice, which was to say then you can't use that septic 24-7, 365 days a year because of your proximity to the pond. And so um, it's not the choice that everyone will need to make, but it's a beginning on certain things. When, when uh, uh, Dr. Nate talks about sectors, we're defining where are we most vulnerable in our town for cesspool upgrades, for septic variances, and for so those things that will begin to um, impact negatively or positively our um, watershed and our environment. Thanks again for letting me speak. I uh, wanted to talk about water more generally. When you have a private property, you have a well, you have a septic system, you pull water out, the water goes back in. It stays pretty local at that point. The larger the, the sewer system, the more likely you are to take water well out of the watershed that you are in, so that you end up with less water to deal with. It may not be all that pure. When, what you're left with, if you are dealing with a, just your private property, mm -hmm. but when the water goes away and it goes out to the ocean, uh, then uh, it creates other kinds of problems. So the, you, you're, you, you mentioned earlier having more uh, areas where there would be uh, sewage treatment plants uh, rather than one common sewer plant that is taking all the water away from all the different watersheds and, and dumping it out in the ocean. Well, yes, that potential for that to happen, um, it could exist, yes. So, but again, going back, I haven't heard anything about anyone actually wanting to do that. They've just, there's just been talk of people suggesting it. So yes, we all know Manomet is the talk of the town right now, uh, but people have only suggested that, oh, we could look at doing that. Um, but again, to your point, we have to there consider were, those things, yes. But having their own sewer system mm -hmm. or septic system. Right, their own wastewater yeah. treatment facility, yeah, right. Wastewater. Right, but yes, so I am definitely not disagreeing with you yeah. on that, but that's something that we have to talk about as an yeah. option if it were to ever come about and to mention yeah. that as a, yeah. as a consequence. As long as not much is happening, it doesn't become a problem. But, right, but... But the, the more this gets centralized the more likely you are to create other kinds of problems. Right, but again, that goes back to actually planning that and into yeah. considering that in the plan because, uh, I mean, I've only been here for a year and I haven't seen any plans to talk about this type of science that you're yeah. talking about. And we have to get to that point sooner yeah. rather than later if we're going to have that as a discussion item. Yeah. I had a question on the, the meetings. And it's just a matter of limited amount of time and maximum a lot of impact. Um, because if I'm not an abutter to the person who's asking for a variance and I come to the meeting and I speak about its impact on me, do I carry any weight? Do I affect the, the decision? Or am I better off spending my time trying to find a way to support new regulations? Um, I'm going to be very, very sort of proprietary in your comment and say both. Um, simply because even though you aren't in the butter, yeah. as in the butter, all we're saying is that you are right next door and your well is going to be closer than what the town of Plymouth in our bylaws requires. So it, that means you're the abutter. But you're also a resident of Plymouth that's using either a pond that is part of the aquifer that has a well maybe someplace else. In other words, we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. So uh, the opinions of everyone, as far as I'm concerned, and uh, uh, Jerry Levine is also here uh, on, the, on the Board of Health, and I, I'm hoping you agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> then you think about it. But if we disagree, you'll see it at the board meeting.
because the public health in Plymouth right now is, is changing. We've got a professional that is well educated and has been well trained with a PhD in public health. So the issues that have been discussed are critical, but he understands them. You have a board right now that is very active and is aggressive enough to want to do something and accomplish some things for the town. And so the problem, of course, is this isn't going to happen in five minutes. And it's, there are political issues. There are issues about uh, cost, who's going to pay for all of these things. There is some funding for upgrading uh, septic system. Uh, uh, septic systems, and the, the, local, uh, the local sewage plants that might be usable in Manomet is a very good idea. Pine Hills is an example of that, and the board is going to be having uh, a seminar on that next, uh, tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow, yes. And uh, so please come, support us, because what we're doing here is to your benefit, and to my benefit, because I live here. And uh, we have, we're very active and we're trying to make some positive changes in this town. And let, let me add to what both of them are saying here, um, interactive moment. How many of you have heard of a subdivision plan review? Okay, okay, a few. So in this subdivision plan review, when we have an issue with someone saying that I'm not in a butter, but I want to know how could this impact the water quality in the area since we're all possibly drinking from a well over here or I have a, my own private well. So it doesn't have to be like an actual subdivision either to do this review. So you all have the ability to come to a meeting to make that recommendation through the board for that to happen. Because I will tell you, um, we don't, like I said, we don't have this regulation in place that says, oh, if you're a non-abutter, how could the flow of a leaching field impact your well if you're downhill? It's not in regulation. So we had that condition put on somebody through um, Brigida and someone else, uh, but she was in the chair at the time. And the results came back. Um, and it was quite frightening, I, I will tell you. Uh, the homeowner was informed about it, but the only time that they had a test of their well was when they put in their septic system, and it came back positive, like in a good way, excuse me. So the results were negative. But this time, um, things such as bromine, um, um, salt, uh, excuse me, um, hydrochloride, excuse me, came back, um, and also sodium came back positively high, double the amount of level of concern. The guy told me he, when he tested the water from the source, it was black. So yes, you do have a say, and I would exercise that ability through the Board of Health when you say, well, how could this be impacting this watershed? Even if you don't live there, even if you go in, if you play in the water. I, I mean, this is where you learn, live, work, and play, and everyone has a stake in it. We've heard a lot of ugly words tonight. <laughs> Cesspool, sewer, septic. But, you know, I'm, I'm still doing this um, with a watershed association because basically we're ahead of the curve here. If you go further north, and I'm a member of the Wildlands uh, Active Association and uh, the Watershed Activity Association, and the people north of us are fighting for water. People south of us on the Cape have much more difficult problems with contaminants in their wells because they have the, the sea around them, so to speak. We have a board of selectmen that has had an experience recently of lo trying to locate a new well for the town. I think it's been a sobering experience because they're, I believe, on board with the severity of the complexity of the problem of, of water and keeping it clean. So that's good. We have people like Dr. Nate who is thinking about this. It's not like we're surprised by cyanobacteria. 
We may not be able to cure it immediately. We may not be able to cure the cause, but we know it's there. We're monitoring it. We have a number of, and I'm not trying to be self-serving here, but we have a number of watershed associations that are, are doing their part to gather data and give data to the town so that the town knows better what goes on. It's, there are encouraging signs here, and I'm encouraged in, in the long run that things are going to go better. And it's, it's due to the people like you who come out and listen to this and make the proper judgments for whether we need to spend the money on sewer, whether we need to spend the money on uh, some of the things that are going to be considered in town meeting this, this uh, fall. I'm a town meeting representative. There is a tightening of the uh, wetlands bylaws that's been proposed. Between us chickens, it doesn't go far enough. If you want to see a really good water um, wetlands bylaw, go to Brewster, the town of Brewster. They have 11 dis different classifications. We have two. They have 11 different classifications for justifying tighter bylaws in wetlands because they're under the gun. And, you know, the indications are all here that we are moving forward before the gun hits us. The second bylaw that's coming up is because of this Bartlett Pond program, uh, the problem with the cyanobacteria, there is a, an article that provides $180,000 to study where this problem is coming from, and not only that, but to try to find out what we can do about it. I mean, we, we all kind of guess that it comes from sewer and septic, but it may not. And this, this study will find out, for the benefit of future ponds that have this problem, what we're up against and what we might do to, to fix it. So um, I wouldn't give up hope. Get educated. Talk to your neighbors. Uh, if, if, a, if a sewer comes by you, don't scream and holler before you research what it might do for you, what it might do for the town. But my experience has been that the beautiful places are the most fragile in this world. They're also the, the most worth saving. And the only way that we can do this, I mean, the selectmen can't do everything. The Board of Health can't do everything. A lot of this has got to come from the community. We've got to rise up to a certain extent and say, enough. You know, I'm madder than hell and I'm not going to take this anymore, to quote the famous movie. But it's not something that we can, we can say, you've got to do this. I mean, we've got to do this. We've got to know enough to be able to go armed with the right ammunition and with the right facts to get people moved in a big sense to do a big project. Because, you know, I am so happy with the new Board of Health and the new Department of Public Works Director. I mean, this, this, is, this is a darn good first step. And seeing this many people here who give a darn about this kind of thing is also encouraging. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, you got to go to meetings. <laughs> but you're already here one. So. No, I'm, I'm fine. I don't that's, have to, I don't have to get time. there. We're fine. But I will also say this. Um, this actually is going to be brought up to the state level through a health equity conference or health equity seminar that I'm going to be talking about. And people have said to me, equity and environment, well, it's true. We have a lot of stakeholders that are on these watersheds. And how do we have an equitable environmental health environment, well, environmental health environment, excuse me, or how do we have equitable um, environmental health? for our people to benefit and to enjoy because not everyone is the same. Everyone comes from different backgrounds and not everyone has the same knowledge about it. Um, and then this is one of the projects that I'm spotlighting as one of my priorities is environmental health. So hopefully we can continue to take this one further, like I said, and, and to look at how do we get, acquire more funds to work with different watersheds um, across Plymouth because, I mean, we are the largest in the state of Massachusetts and we have a lot of area to cover. So it's a huge priority for me and also for the board. Um, so this is just not me doing lip service. Um, this is, hey, we want to see this through five years, ten years. Um, I plan on being here for a very long time. Um, 
Yes, I do. And, uh, <laughs> and I realize that this is going to be a big, integral part of our mission. Um, so, yes, uh, be on the lookout for a lot of things to come. I'll just say, as uh, education chair of Herring Crohn's Watershed Association, we're very much aware that most people don't know they live in a watershed. And secondary, they don't know what a watershed is. And so if you know people like that, we do have copies of our uh, stewardship and volunteer action guide back on the counter, and you're welcome to take one. Please. Just a quick question, which is, uh, are alternative technologies such as composting toilets or incineration, or just, I know there's a sort of on the periphery, but uh, any possible, you know, action there? Uh, yeah, that, I'm like so excited to hear you bring that up because, um, yes, they are on the precipice of discussion because that's going to take both um, an implementation for sure and a regulatory piece. Um, so we are in talks about that because I did have someone to email me about piloting a layer cake system. Um, and I've been out for a while, so I got to go through old emails and catch up. But there's talk of that. And then as Brigitte mentioned, on the 24th of October, we're going to have Buzzers Bay Coalition come and talk. They've done some really good work in this area to pilot these types of different technologies. Um, so, But some of these technologies are not DEP approved, but it doesn't mean that we can't move forward and test these out. Um, so that's going to take the will of the people to be able to want to do that and then also to control this in a regulatory manner. So we're looking at this. We want to provide the best to, to Plymouthians. It's just, you know, we got to get out in front and talk about these things and talk about these benefits. Um, but in terms of the composting toilet, I will say um, in areas um, such as, uh, it's not situate. What is the area uh, over there, um, What the wild, wild west, as it's been dubbed? Um, no, someone help me out. I forget. Saquish. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Saquish. So in areas such as Saquish, nobody knows what's going on. Um, <laughs> and it's right. And it's Plymouth, right? Um, and I won't get into the property talk about selling it or whatever, but um, anywho, but the point being is that no one knows. But for the first time, we're actually going to see what's going on and to be able to say, Hey, from a regulatory perspective, what is it that we need to do? What technologies do we really need to implement to actually reach out to the homeowner who's way over in China to be like, hey, dude, you know, or do that. Put in a, a composting system and, and tell us how often it's been cleaned up, and we'll send an automated message to people. Um, so that way they're like, oh, I didn't know about this. But we're going to work on doing it in that fashion. So, so yes, and we're very excited to look at these things. Don, that, that, yeah, that's all I got unless there's more questions. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I look forward to a great future here. So thank you.